Well, sure, Dr. Miano, I'm sure you could find something that you could call intermediate, but would it live up to your own standards of evidence? Tracing origins can be tricky. When we try to ascertain continuity and influence, we have to look for specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantity. Of course, Dr. Miano wasn't talking about cultural diffusion disseminating art or architecture in that clip. He was talking about cultural diffusion disseminating constellations. That was a clip from his video, How Old is the Zodiac? Granted, because certain groups of stars attract attention, there's bound to be some similarity among various cultures as to what they see as a constellation. And it's entirely possible for two people in different parts of the world to look up at the same constellation and think of the same animal, if they both know of the animal, even though they never had any contact whatsoever. So tracing origins can be tricky. When we try to ascertain continuity and influence, we have to look for specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantity. But I think most of us watching would agree. When you're looking for signs of cultural diffusion, that's one culture influencing another, the same set of criteria should apply. Whether we're talking about pottery, arrowheads, construction styles, or constellations, cultural diffusion is basically reliant on the same set of circumstances. That's either trade through indirect influence or through direct influence with two cultures actually meeting up with each other. The further separated the cultures would be through time and space, the more difficult it would be to actually draw a link between and the more you're going to need those specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantity that Dr. Miano spoke of. Now, I'm going to be holding him to those standards throughout this video. I'm going to be holding his feet to the fire on this one, and I'm also going to be uh, pointing out where there's flaws in his timeline as we go forward. Hi, my name's Dan, and welcome to Dunking. Okay, so you said yourself, Graham, that if you could see this gradual development of skills, you wouldn't need to invoke a lost civilization. But you asked for a lot. You wanted to see how the hunter-gatherers became equipped to create this site, where they learned their skills to carve and move the stone, how it was possible for them to organize a workforce, and how they could feed the workforce. My research has shown me how it was possible to do all of these things. And for your convenience below this video, I will provide links to all the papers that give us the information. And thanks for those links, Doc. Um, Reddit user Manbro Calrissian already went through and nitpicked him to the degree before I even had a chance to watch your video, and that was pretty helpful. Of course, I still did my own research. I'm not just going to take anybody's word for any of it, but him showing me that basically told me I wouldn't be wasting my time making this video or digging into all this. He found a number of issues, including one that Dr. Miano himself had to admit was an error. So thank you, Manbro Calrissian, just as much as thanking Dr. Miano for looking at those links that he brought. During the Paleolithic period, which lasted a very long time. People lived in small, wandering, hunter-gatherer groups. But then, some people began abandoning the nomadic lifestyle. This is in the period we call Epipaleolithic, sometimes called Mesolithic. And what makes Epipaleolithic cultures of this part of the world so interesting is that hunter-gatherers began settling down. Now, before this, they may have set up camp in one spot for a few months, but now, they could settle down permanently. This probably had a lot to do with the climate, which grew milder in the Holocene, and in these regions, wild grains grew in abundance. Not only flora, but also the fauna of the region flourished, so there was plenty of game for hunting. There was no longer any need to pick up shop and go somewhere else to find food. For this reason, hunter-gatherers began to build. Well, this is true, and it's a fair point, but it doesn't provide evidence of diffusion from one culture to another as far as when we're looking for a gradual development, because according to Dr. Miano's standards, we, we have to look for specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantity. So we can't call it evidence of influence. Just because they're neighbors doesn't mean that they shared any cultural elements. Now, now I know that this seems absurd, but this is the position Dr. Miano has taken in regards to constellations. Two neighboring cultures, we can't assume that they share constellations from the zodiac. No matter how ubiquitous they are later on in history, we cannot assume that these two cultures shared them unless we find those specific and unique characteristics. Now, Graham, I have heard you on many occasions say that archaeologists have told us that Simple hunter-gatherers, or primitive hunter-gatherers, built Gebekli Tepe, and how ludicrous this idea is. But I have never heard archaeologists refer to hunter-gatherers of this region and time period as simple or primitive. In fact, since long before Gebekli Tepe was even excavated, they have been saying something rather different than that. So we really have to take note here that hunting and gathering refers to a method of food acquisition. That's it. It is not a term 
that refers to the technological level or building skills of the people. Name me one hunter-gatherer society that's harnessed electricity. Just one. The term hunter-gatherer absolutely does apply to a methodology for procuring food. However, it correlates heavily with tech level. Uh, there's no question about that. Now, I addressed this type of thinking in my very first video. And while I understand that primitive or simple are frequently culturally insensitive terms, they're also descriptive terms. And then very recently, archaeologists continued to use them to describe hunter-gatherer societies and other cultures. Because that way of life is more primitive, it is simpler. My 15-year-old knows more about the solar system than all the hunter-gatherer cultures and all of history put together. His mind is filled with knowledge that's not sustenance-based. And I think that we would all agree that that is the most basic, the most simple, the most primitive of human needs is just finding food. And while these hunter-gatherer cultures teach their children to poke in a mound of dirt to find ants for a snack or to look at the clouds to tell them what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. I'm teaching my kid how to repair combustion engines and how to do geometry. This is infinitely more complicated and more advanced. It is the opposite, the, the opposite of those terms being simple and primitive. So, I understand, again, those are potentially culturally insensitive terms, but I don't see anybody from Gobekli Tepe 12,000 years ago coming to bitch about it, so I think we can probably get away with using them here. Let's consider the Natufian culture of the Epipaleolithic period, about 15,000 to 11,500 years ago. They existed before and during the Younger Dryas period. We find in the remains left from their settlements evidence of the initiation of purposeful and planned production of food for the first time in the archaeological record, but not agriculture. We're talking about systematic food gathering and organized hunting and the creation of storage facilities. Among the tools they used for gathering plants, such as sickles, are ground stone tools used for grinding and processing, and some of the mortars are made of basalt, yes, a very hard stone. But I wanted to point this out to show that people here were creating usable tools out of hard stone. They are the first in the area to have large cemeteries and a wide array of symbolic expressions. And they also used figurative art, including not only animals, but human figures. Sometimes whole bodies, sometimes heads or faces. As you probably know, both types of symbolic expression appear at Gebekli Tepe. So while common sense might say these two cultures have a connection, according to Dr. Miano's own standards, there's really nothing here to hold tie these two cultures together. It doesn't meet the criteria that he set himself for cultural diffusion. Now, Dr. Miano, if you happen to watch this, I would really love to hear what specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantities we find between the Natufian culture or Gobekli Tepe. Now, if you feel that that's an unfair way of evaluating this, perhaps you would care to reevaluate your position on the ancientness of the Zodiac. And if neither of those is acceptable, would you mind explaining why the standards are different between these two areas? Take a look at the settlement of Anan in what is now northern Israel. There was a society of about 250 people who stayed put for around 2,000 years, harvesting and hunting and living in abundance. These people were not simple or primitive. And there, we find evidence for an artistic explosion as well. They created symbolic artifacts and structures too. These structures, which are in the form of circular houses made with stones, and a larger building, probably communal in nature, are the precursors to what we find in Gebekli Tepe. <laughs> Neither primitive nor simple. Yeah, yeah, stacking stones in circles to make an enclosure is just as complicated and advanced as what I did when I wired houses for a living. Now, anyway, stating it as a fact that this is a precursor to what we find at Gobekli Tepe is quite the stretch. Is a round building made of stacked stones specific or unique? How about the art that we find at those sites? Now, why do I harp on about this? Well, it's a clear double standard at work here. If you ask Dr. Miano why the Sphinx couldn't possibly be a depiction of Leo, one of his answers is going to be there's no evidence the 4th Dynasty Egyptians knew the Mesopotamian constellations, even though they're right next door to each other, and even though you have specific and unique characteristics, a lion and the ecliptic. Leo was one of the very first constellations and was known long before the 4th Dynasty Egyptians were doing anything. But that correlation is not specific, it's not unique as far as Dr. Miano is concerned. However, when it comes to disproving Graham Hancock, any old stack of rocks in a circle 
is the influence of another ro stack of rocks on down the road. As long as it disproves Hancock, we can tie these correlations, however tenuous they might be together. Now, to be honest with you, this is pretty normal. It's we all tend to find reasons to support what we believe and to undermine the things that we don't believe. But this mentality really makes for poor debunking, as we see here. I mean, I can easily highlight this double standard, making both of his positions appear weaker than they might otherwise actually be, maybe even weaker than they are in reality. Now, of course, this does require some jackass to go around and look through all these different videos and, you know, glue things together. While pre-Natufian art is rare in this region, it wasn't non-existent. Check out these engraved plaquettes, excavated from the site of Ein Kashish. Some of the engravings, which included geometric motifs, roughly resemble finds from the same period in Europe, which have been interpreted as systems of notation or artificial memory systems. That is, ways to keep track of the timing of the seasons, which would have been important to hunter-gatherers. I say this because the imagery at Gebekli Tepe also might have been applied to store, share, and transmit information, which I think you would agree with, Graham. But probably these are related to subsistence and social matters, which you probably disagree with. Whatever the case, we have precursors here to the art of Gebekli Tepe. And I might add, among objects found in the Natufian culture are several large and heavy limestone slabs, which are incised with geometric designs. Mind you, these are early days, so the slabs are irregular in shape and not as big as at Gebekli Tepe, but they have been, in many cases, leveled and smoothed, sometimes even polished. We see here the beginnings of the very technology that is seen at Gebekli Tepe later. Now notice he's willing to accept parallels from Europe here, which is fine, except he would never be willing to do so when it comes to astronomy, at least not with that degree of certainty. Here we have a bird, some Triforce thing, and a tall rock. These are not very similar to Gobekli Tepe in anything other than superficial ways. Perhaps this is a precursor to Gobekli Tepe, but that's just a guess, right? So we have nothing that demonstrates one site influenced another, at least nothing that would satisfy Dr. Miano's criteria if these were constellations we were discussing. We all know big rocks being stacked isn't evidence of one culture influencing another, right? We have buildings that are bigger on the bottom than on the top. And over here, we also have buildings that are bigger on the bottom than the top. But when I look at these, I don't see identical features. I see way more differences than I see similarities. And the similarities are always super generic. They're not all that different from saying, hey, over here we have standard masonry. And over here we have standard masonry. Halan Chemi was a small village settlement in southeastern Turkey, not far from where Gebekli Tepe would soon be built. It was established in the closing millennium of the Epipaleolithic period, during the Younger Dryas, and lasted for a few centuries into the Neolithic. This is significant because whereas most Epipaleolithic sites were abandoned at the end of the Younger Dryas, this one lasted through. All right, and now we're on to the second tune of this video. Halam Semi Tepesi, again, I pronounce everything horribly, I'm very sorry, is the beginning of the sites that are very close in Gobekli Tepe's date that we can really only guess which ones came first. The margin of error in the carbon dating makes it impossible to discern which one is older than the other. Gobekli Tepe is dated between 11,500 and 11,000 years ago. Halan Semi Tepesi is dated to 11,800 to 11,200 years ago, and the margin of error makes them overlap heavily. So we're in a position where Dr. Miano can argue that this site's older and Hancock could claim it's not, and that really makes us a poor piece of evidence in order to disprove Hancock's position, doesn't it? If Gobekli Tepe was indeed a transference of technology, then it would stand to reason that neighboring sites would emulate Gobekli Tepe. This means that sites that we can't date sequentially with reliable methods could be precursors or they could be primitive versions of it. Simple imitations of Gobekli Tepe. In short, if you want to debunk Hancock here, you're going to need more than your own thoughts to un undermine his own thoughts. The finds from Halan Chemi also contain evidence of cultural relationships with other cultures, including earlier, contemporary, and later ones. Oh, no, 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 you don't get to claim that cows are cultural markers unless those look super similar. As we've been over already, if this was a lion and leo, this wouldn't fly for Dr. Miano. So I am not going to let the horns of some bull pass as obviously connected any more than I would big rocks stacked in a circle as evidence of a connection. Only a portion of the center of the site has been excavated so far, but we have found traces of semi-subterranean circular buildings like those seen at Natufian settlements. 
and take a look. This stone-walled circular building stands out from the other circular structures of the site. It's built bigger and better than the surrounding buildings. Large circular structures, as you know, are found also at Gebekli Tepe. <laughs> no, I know I'm still beating this drum a little bit, but come on, man. Large circular structures are absurdly common all around the globe. The Celts had roundhouses, Native Americans, etc., etc., etc. Are you going to assume that the Turks and the Celts and the Native Americans all were culturally connected? Of course not. So, <sighs> a circle of rocks is not very good evidence for anything. I'm sorry, you're going to need more than that in order to demonstrate a clear line of progression from one culture to the next. And take a look at this. This is another type of object found in the assemblage. A series of small notched stone batons made of schist or something similar were found. They represent... F I don't care what you think these represent. No offense, Dr. Miano, but how many of these were found at Gobekli Tepe? None? So you just want to bring these up and say, well, I think that they might. Well, that's great. Hancock thinks some stuff, too. If you want to debunk his thoughts, bring more than your thoughts and unrelated artifacts. Kortik Tepe is a low mound on the Tigris River in southeastern Turkey. The stone remains found there are from the earliest level, which comes from the late Epipaleolithic, 11th to 10th millennium BCE, the carbon dating for Kortik Tepe does not show that date. It shows 9th to 10th millennium BCE, making it overlap with Gobekli Tepe. Now, the author of the paper, Dr. Miano Links, does claim the site's older, as old as Dr. Miano said, but the carbon dating doesn't support that. It suggests the site is contemporary to Gobekli Tepe. Look at this. A chlorite plaquette from Kortik Tepe has a supernatural scorpion relief. Here is a chlorite vessel found among grave goods, and it is incised with scorpions and snakes. Venomous creatures like scorpions, snakes, spiders, and centipedes were associated with the world of the dead at this time in the Fertile Crescent. As you know, scorpion and snake imagery appears also at Gebekli Tepe. And the scorpion symbol has been used to portray a constellation, one that grew up right in that area and just popped up out of prehistory. We don't know when it began, but it came right out of that area. For thousands of years, we know that that thing survived. It's got a lot of longevity. But if someone associated with Graham Hancock was to say, I think this scorpion is a precursor to this scorpion that symbolizes a constellation, all of a sudden your standards would change. You would require those specific and unique characteristics in sufficient quantity, and you can't draw these tenuous links anymore. Funny how that works. Again, everybody does this. This isn't specific to Dr. Miano. Perhaps you've heard of the site of Tel Es Sultan. It's the place known as Jericho. The site was occupied during the Epipaleolithic period, but it was during the pre-pottery Neolithic A period that we find evidence of permanent settlement and considerable development. Found here were round, semi-subterranean houses, just as we have already seen in the Natufian culture. Around the perimeter of the settlement, the residents constructed and repeatedly reconstructed a massive stone wall. On the inner side of the wall, archaeologists found a tower of solid masonry through which a stairway ascended to the top. Once again, we find carbon dates that don't quite line up with Dr. Miano's assertion. Jericho is dated to after the time of Gobekli Tepe, with the overlap for margin of error basically its contemporary, not part of a pattern of continuity according to the hard data. Another important pre-pottery Neolithic A site, which dates to just before Gobekli Tepe, is Jerf al-Amar which is situated on two hills on the bank of the Euphrates in northern Syria. It was built and rebuilt over several centuries, there being ten village levels. The first four villages yielded exclusively circular structures, while rectangular structures were found only in the most recent three or four villages. These later ones were carbon dated to the final centuries of occupation, that is, after 11,000 years ago, before the onset of the early pre-pottery Neolithic B which is the period that Gobekli Tepe is from. Jerf el Amar is contemporary to Gobekli Tepe. There's no argument really about that from academics. Dr. Miano himself admitted as much to that in the Reddit thread. The houses of the settlement, which were found by their sub-circular stone foundation courses, clustered around cooking hearths, were small. But communal buildings are attested too. One of them was only partly investigated before it was flooded, but the other one, which was in the center of the settlement, and which was surrounded by rectangular buildings, communal structure EA-53, 
was discovered in the form of a massive cylindrical subterranean structure about seven meters in diameter and two meters below ground level. There was a hexagonal floor at the center which was made of decorated stone panels. The sides were formed of a retaining wall built of stone blocks set in mud mortar. It was about 2.4 meters high and was built with slots to accommodate wooden posts and was plastered. The hexagonal shape of the floor is nearly perfect. This means there was an abstract planning process. They decided they wanted to place the posts at the hexagon nodes. This planning may have been done at the site prior to construction, but maybe even away from the site. There is no question that accurate measuring was being done. So we find two design concepts they must have known. Architectural floor planning and measuring well enough so that they could reproduce proportions on a larger scale than what they pre-designed. Now, Dr. Miano admitted in the Reddit thread that he made a mistake here and that this enclosure is actually later than the T-pillars at Gobekli Tepe and this should not be considered part of the precursors to Gobekli Tepe. So, whatever you would like to think about Dr. Miano, whatever you want to say about him, anybody in this sphere that's actually willing to admit when they make an error is okay in my book, even if there's somebody that I think is wrong all the time. <laughs> Another large and architecturally complex structure dating to the earliest phase of the Neolithic period has been found in the southern rather than the northern Levant. This shows that this kind of production was widespread within Southwest Asia at this time. The site is known simply as WF-16 and dated to 11,200 years ago. I want to show you a structure within it called Structure O-75. The remains of many well-preserved semi-subterranean earthen walled structures were found and these were clustered around structure 075. We don't know the function of the structure yet, but it provides further evidence for communal building activity, collective labor, and the use of symbols to express ideas in art and architecture, prior to the domestication of plants and animals and prior to Gebekli Tepe. Whitey Finan 16 was settled before Gobekli Tepe was built, but a significant enclosure that Dr. Miano speaks of is contemporary with Gobekli Tepe. Maybe noticing a pattern. Dr. Miano seems to assume that all the dates support his position. Then we have the site of Kermaz Dera, the earliest layers of which date to 11,990 years ago. I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear that Quirmes Dere is also dated to be contemporary with Gobekli Tepe, with the carbon dating actually saying that Gobekli Tepe is a touch older. Likewise, at the site of Hassan Kaif Hoyuk, which dates to just before the time of Gobekli Tepe. Hassan Kaif Hoyuk is dated to about 9,500 to 10,000 years ago. Once again, the site is contemporary to Gobekli Tepe. Pretty hard to claim that it, it was a predecessor when it's basically a little bit younger even. At the site of Gusir Hoyuk, then there is Chakmak Tepe, a firm date for the establishment of the site of Karahan Tepe, it's still pending as far as I know, Harbetsufan Tepesi, Navali Chori, Sefer Tepe, and Hamzan Tepe. Busir Hoyak dating says it's about a thousand years younger than Gobekli Tepe. Kakmak Tepe has no carbon dating that I can find as the site is still being excavated. He admits Karan Tepe is unknown. Hersbefudan Tepe he mentions in passing, but it's also contemporary to Gobekli Tepe, as is Navalai Kore and Hazman Tepe. In other words, he has exactly one piece of evidence, the Natufian culture, in regards to sites that can be clearly shown to have potentially influenced Gobekli Tepe as far as the dating goes. Everything else, every other single site he mentions, requires one to assume that the errors are in his favor or that the dating has yet to be done will be in his favor. Even then, we have to ignore his standards of evidence for cultural diffusion in order to give him the Natufian culture. So when he says... I've only given you a taste of what was going on before Gobekli Tepe. You could be forgiving to say that there was no taste at all. From what I understand, excavations are still in progress at approximately 12 sites in an area of about 100 kilometers around. It is clear that Gobekli Tepe was not alone. It was part of a super community. But as it is the biggest of the sites, it seems reasonable to guess that it was a center of attraction for artisans and those exchanging valuable materials. Yes, this was a new, highly successful, and expansive way of life, much different than what it had been like before. 
It brought advantages in the diversification of culture, the capacity for innovation, adaptations, and resilience, but it clearly had its roots in the past. It clearly took some time to get to this point. Yes, it clearly did. Now, sadly, neither Dr. Miano nor Graham Hancock have provided very good evidence to support their position on how these skills were developed. All the claims of we know they had to have had a precedent doesn't dismiss Hancock's position. It just means it came from somewhere else. The carbon dating could dismiss Hancock's position, but the carbon dating doesn't. Just a reminder that I am an ancient historian, but not a prehistorian. I had to do the same kind of work here as you would have had to do. I realize that your form of research more often consists of interviewing people about the sites, so I expect you don't have the time or the desire to stick your head into all the studies and reports, so I'm hoping my work here on your behalf will prove of some use to you. Oh, don't you worry, Doc. Guys like Man Broke Car Racing and myself, we'll take a look at these, and we'll hand Hancock with the information that we gleaned from it that he would want, and that way he's got the facts at hand. As I make more and more videos that criticize both sides of this debate, I find that there's a lot of people that just can't handle listening to anything that they don't agree with. So thanks for being one of the people that will actually take the time to listen to my opinion, whether you like to hear everything that I have to say or not. You know, there's a lot of ancient history channels out there on YouTube, a lot of people that dive into these kinds of weird mysteries. There's a lot of places you could be. This channel's not for everyone. But you made it this far. Seems like this channel is for you. So thanks a lot. Hey, have a great night. We'll see you next time.